Good morning and welcome to another virtual session from Turnstile Tours. My name is Stefan DW and uh, once again we find ourselves here on a Tuesday talking about maritime things. Turnstile Tours is an organization that uh, works to build community, to connect people. And the uh, pandemic and the lockdown made this a lot harder for us to do. So we quickly pivoted from doing our usual in-person tours, introducing people to uh, our nonprofit partners uh, like the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the Prospect Park Alliance and the uh, Brooklyn Historical Society. And we pivoted to doing these virtual tours uh, more than 100 sessions ago. And today, uh, we're talking with uh, an organization that's sort of adjacent to our interests at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, the Siemens Church Institute, with uh, senior archivist Jonathan Thayer. And in full disclosure, uh, one of my other titles in my life, aside from uh, doing the maritime stuff with the Turnstile Tours, is as associate archivist for Siemens Church Institute. So we're uh, dealing with things I look at on a regular basis. Uh, before we bring Jonathan on, a couple of notes about how we operate here. If you're new to Turnstile Tours virtual programs, welcome. And welcome back to those of you who uh, are returning to us. Uh, we, uh, in the spirit of connecting one another uh, virtually, we encourage you to open that chat box you find at the bottom of your screen and introduce yourself, let us know where you're watching from. I've uh, got a couple of regular folks out there who are, have turned up again. And we have Doug, uh, one of our staff members, and he's producing the show today, making sure everything runs smoothly. And he will be monitoring the chat box, making sure that I see your questions and get them to Jonathan Thayer. Uh, we also have back there Cindy, the founder of Turnstile Tours today. She is captioning this. So if you're interested in reading what you're, we are hearing, then you can hit the closed captioning button at the bottom there, and you'll uh, see some approximation of what we're saying. Uh, during the slideshow part of our presentation, we'll let Google's automatic functions take over that job. Hello, Howie. Glad to see you're out there. And we've got uh, uh, Balby in Fairlawn and Robert in Forest Hills. I'm over here in Flushing. Hello, Robert. Uh, just a little ways away from here. Lots of great folks out there watching the show today. Uh, a couple of upcoming events. We are sort of slowing down from our usual pace that got us to 100 shows in 90 some odd days. Uh, but Thursday, we are honoring the closing day at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, the day the Navy left the Navy Yard. Andrew Gustafson, one of our, our leaders of our, our uh, Turnstile Tours program, at 12.30, a different time than normal, uh, but the time we'll be visiting more frequently in the future, 12.30 on Thursday, uh, Andrew Gustafson will do a program on closing uh, the day at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And then Sunday, we have a program, uh, Amanda uh, Brennan, my colleague here, uh, who does a lot of stuff downtown and with food, is talking uh, with folks in a downtown location, a conversation with an organization called Think Chinatown, speaking with co-founder Ying Kong. And that's on Sunday, I believe that's also at 11, we're back at 11 o'clock for that Sunday show with Amanda Brennan. So uh, look forward to all those coming up in the future. Now we'll turn our gaze to the waterfront way downtown at South Street, uh, where uh, the Siemens Church Institute had its iconic uh, headquarters from the uh, late teens, uh, late 19 teens until uh, the uh, late 60s. And uh, Jonathan Thayer, uh, welcome. Uh, we'll have you come join us and tell us all about the Siemens Church Institute and its uh, roots here on the waterfront. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks to- Great. Turn good, good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Um, yeah, Turnstile Tour is really impressed with the output. It's, uh, it's sort of alarming how productive you all are being <laughs> um, during the, the pandemic, but it's inspiring too. So thanks for having me and um, uh, just a little bit about me. I've been working for Siemens Church uh, since 2010, so I'm in my 10th year as archivist. Um, Siemens were, you, uh, were, were you involved with boats before Siemens Church Institute? I mean, you're, you're an archivist, a historian. How, yeah. what, how did you connect with, of all the places, Siemens Church Institute is a very unusual organization. How did you connect with it? 
Yeah, so I came I came to Siemens Church as an archivist. So I had some tangential maritime connection through my family and I'm from New England originally, but in terms of um, my work history, no real significance. So I came on um, as, as purely as an archivist and over time I've become, uh, you know, maritime historian. I, I, got my PhD in history from the CUNY Graduate Center, wrote my dissertation on uh, sailor towns and uh, merchant sailors. By sailor towns, you mean? Sailor towns, uh, it's, it's um, an, an historical term and concept referring uh, to areas and port cities where sailors tended to cluster. So it'd be where um, port traffic would be uh, heightened and then there'd be sort of sailor culture which involved boarding houses and saloons and all those other things that you know we hear about and and uh um i'll talk a bit more about that specific to um uh, manhattan um and, but and if, that's something that we don't really have anymore because of containerization right exactly yeah so it, it is sort of a universal concept it's not specific to new york but as as you say Sailor towns are sort of a thing of the past since uh, containerization has pushed port traffic further and further from urban centers as it has in, in New York. Um, and seafarers are, um, especially blue water seafarers are, are further and further removed from, from urban centers. And, uh, you know, I think in the description of this, this talk, uh, we, we refer to uh, seafarers is sort of th this invisible workforce because us folks who live in port cities and, and port towns, um, you know, it's easy to overlook or not see them at all or even see ships coming in. And meanwhile, we rely on them for almost everything we consume and purchase and buy and um, our entire economy depends on maritime commerce. So it's yeah. just, and, yeah. and today it's, it's all the more uh, invisible because the turnaround times for these container ships are so short. They're only in port for a couple of hours. And then with the lockdown, we have sailors who have seafarers who've not been able to get off their ships for very long periods of time. People who were coming to the end of their tour and were gonna go off after three or four months on board a ship and they got extended for six or nine months. Um, right. And it's, it's, uh, so those are sort of the two big phases that I don't know how much we're going to get into the modern piece, but uh, Yeah, we'll get there eventually. I mean, I have a lot of historical contextualization, you know, I'm, I'm an historian, in addition to being an archivist. So, um, but I, I definitely want to talk about what Siemens Church is doing now, because it's in no way is it sort of, a, you know, a strictly historical organization, they're doing a ton of great work today and I do want to make sure to get to that so um, great well let's let's do that let's get into it okay so I'm going to share my screen and uh, looks good okay and how's my yeah, volume? am I okay on volume volume's good so we'll get to, to present in the uh, closed captioning when it comes up okay so captions are up Yes, beautiful. All right, so we're ready to go, I think. So I really love this map. Um, it's from 1868, and you can see it uh, shows Manhattan and um, part, part of Brooklyn there, and it's divided into to wards. This is from David Rumsey's map collection, R-U-M-S-E-Y. Um, he has a private map collection, hundreds of thousands of historical maps that he's digitized and made publicly accessible on his website. Uh, just in case you're looking for good maps, um, good historical maps. So- uh, and I love that we've got the Brooklyn Navy Yard here. It looks, is that a mill pond down there in the Brooklyn Navy Yard? I'm gonna leave that one up to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll cover that in another show. Yeah. Uh, so my, my area of focus really is uh, the Southern you know, the lower, lower Manhattan, essentially. So if you can see, it might be a little hard to see, but the, the map is divided into wards. 
um, which, uh, you know, Man Manhattan and Brooklyn um, were uh, divided into an, up until 1938, I believe, when they switched to a different um, organization system. But these were basically voting, uh, voting districts. And so um, if we're looking at Ward 7, 4, 2, 1 would be the battery. So if you're going right up towards Corlier's hook, those four wards there, one, two, four, seven, and then on the North River, the, um, or the Hudson River, um, you'd have one, uh, I believe two, no, one, three, and yeah, one and three primarily. So they did these five wards where there was um, incredible port traffic and this clustering of sailor culture um, may turn this district into uh, what we can now look back on as a sailor town, especially as you get closer to the, to the coastline. So in terms of Siemens Church, it's been around since 1834. Um, and it started out as a typical Episcopal ministry organization, not focusing on, on seamen or sailors specifically, but um, just doing sort of typical missionary work in rural upstate New York and Appalachia and also internationally. So they had missionaries in Africa. Um, they were operating under a different organizational name until 1843 when um, essentially the board decided to turn their focus inward. Uh, they were based in New York and they uh, saw sailors in the sailor town districts as an at-risk population, so to speak. So um, they launched this uh, project that was fairly typical of the 19th century um, an early era of uh, proselytization and temperance pledges, um, but a very unique one in terms of the uh, folks who were being targeted, sailors. So this is the floating church of our savior. And this is really where we kick off the historical timeline of Siemens Church as we know it as an organization focused on the welfare of, of, of sailors and seafarers. So this was a ferry boat that Siemens Church converted into uh, obviously a church. Um, this is actually the second incarnation of the floating church. We don't have a photograph of the original, which has this really impressive uh, Gothic um, belfry. And it's really, we have uh, drawings and illustrations, but no photographs. But you can see, I mean, it was right, it was planted right there um, in Pike Street, which is in the seventh ward. And the intention was that's, that's part of the South Street Seaport District near the Brooklyn Bridge, right? Yeah, it would have been um, fairly close to the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah. Uh, but and, eventually, because, which was a, a twinkle in the eye at most at that time. Right, right. So, and you can see by the traffic here, there's people moving cargo and, and carts and all sorts of bustle and uh, activity. And um, so uh, this guy, Reverend Benjamin uh, Parker, was appointed first chaplain of the, of the floating church. And in our archives, we have his journals. So he, um, he served as chaplain uh, for several decades until his death. And his journals, and there, there's probably six or seven volumes at least, um, they detail these first encounters and his day-to-day -day activity tending to this parish of transient sailors. So there, these, you know, every, every service he held, he'd have a different uh, audience because sailors were constantly getting off ships and getting on ships and moving um, on and off land. Uh, so this is really, you know, unprecedented and unique in terms of the diversity of what his parish uh, constituted and um, those journals are really invaluable resources in terms of understanding the early history of, of what Siemens Church was all about. Um, second floating ch uh, church was built on the North or Hudson River 
uh, at the foot of Day Street. And again, we don't have a photograph of it, but this is a, a fairly good rendering. Same idea, and you can see it's, it's right right up to the edge of the, the pier, and folks are, um, you know, there's there's a lot of activity here. So there, essentially, the those wards that I pointed out on the map, that's not only is that the footprint of Sailor Town, but it's the footprint of the early um, ministry outpost of Siemens Church, beginning with these floating chapels. Uh, additionally, um, now were these floating chapels, why were they floating? Were they moving? Andrea wants to know if it was steerable. Uh, no, they would, they, they would, uh, they would essentially dock them and, and they wouldn't move. In fact, the first one sank where it was. There was a um, snowstorm and the roof collapsed uh, under the weight of the, the snow and ice. And it, it, was, it was kind of sunk there and wrecked. So that's why they had to replace it. Um, the second floating chapel, uh, this, this floating chapel was actually towed to Staten Island in 1907 I believe um, and it you know they used they used it on land until it was destroyed by fire in the 50s uh, I think in 1958. Yeah it was out by like Howland Hook sort of at the uh, west end of the North Shore if I'm not mistaken. Yeah yeah you would know better than I. <laughs> Staten Island right yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah I think it was uh, I mean they were floating I guess but you know, they weren't they weren't moving them around. This is based on an English model, a British model of maritime ministry, where you would actually have churches kind of floating around ports or harbors and um, actually pulling up alongside ships. Um, but th these churches were pretty much stationary once they got to their, their destination along the piers. So again, you know, that this sort of uh, decentralized ministry model that Siemens Church implemented. So they have floating churches on both sides of Manhattan, and then they start to open up um, reading rooms and uh, ministry outposts. This one's at 341 West Street. Um, and I love this picture because if you can see closely, you'll see the uh, church and reading room for Siemens on the right. And on the left, you'll see um, what must be a saloon because they're advertising for um, lager, beer, and port. Um, and so here you have side by side, sort of, you know, in one in one picture, um, what was uh, what was at stake for these uh, missionaries? They were, you know, attempting to uh, compete with um, with these, you know, elements of Sailor Town that they perceived to be nefarious or threatening. Uh, so I, I really think that picture illustrates the mission. And some of these photos are a little... There were real problems with drink. I mean, drink you know, was a, a great way of, of hoodwinking sailors and taking their money and getting them into yeah. you know, situations. You know, I recently found a photo in the archives that shows the, the later building we'll get into in a minute, uh, 25 South Street. And from the 1950s, it's actually a photo of the celebration of the uh, the, the construction of the opening of the uh, south end of the FDR Drive. So we're talking, I think, oh, wow. and yeah, pretty late photo. And there's a bar right next to 25 South Street. Yeah. Um, well, they, they really planted themselves in, in the heart of uh, Sailor Town. So, you know, they, they were right up against saloons. We'll talk about boarding houses a little bit. Um, and like, and like you say, these were places where sort of underhanded uh, shipping agreements, contracts, um, prostitution, you know, some of those stereotypical things are, were, were happening for sure, they're documented. Um, and so these, these, uh, these ministry outposts were meant to create sort of like a safe space, uh, an alternative space to, to counteract those forces. Of course, not all, not all of it was so nefarious, you know, maybe a sailor just wanted to get a, a beer. Um, we can all, you know, I, I can relate to that. Absolutely. Um, so, another reading room uh, along County Slip, 
down in, in Ward 1. I'll speed this up a bit because I have a lot of slides. Uh, this is a, a cool picture of a tent, uh, tent service, a Pier 5. So they, they were pretty creative about, you know, how to, how to reach sailors, um, whether it was building floating churches, holding peer services, um, building outposts and reading rooms. And um, so they, they were going out and, and uh, oh, the other thing about this, this building is they appointed a missionary at large who just sort of roamed around Sailor Town on foot and would um, knock on doors and, and that was his approach to um, to reaching to reaching sailors. So boarding houses. This is a special topic of interest to me. Uh, SCI wound up purchasing and operating its own sailors boarding house at 52 Market Street um, from 1894 to 1907, and. The, re the reason why this is so interesting to me is that um, going through the census data, and I've written a, a bit about this, um, and we're doing research now on it, uh, these districts, these wards were so littered with sailors' boarding houses that along one block, you could have, you know, seven to ten adjacent sailors' boarding houses, each with its own ethnic um, identity. So you'd have the Norwegian sailors' boarding house next to the Spanish uh, sailors boarding house. And um, these, again, these were sites that were perceived and in, re in, in reality, a lot of nefarious activity happened here. Uh, maybe most, most important, this is where people were being hired by recruiters from ships and port to go work on, on vessels and those contracts weren't always on the up and up. Um, but other, other activities that Siemens Church felt it was necessary to eradicate, essentially. Um, really, boarding houses were the epicenter of those activities in the eyes of the, these reformers. So moving on to more your, modern- Your comment about the, uh, the, the ethnic specificity makes a lot of sense because, you know, the language barriers that people faced at that time and still today, I mean, we, you know, we have so many of our uh, uh, our chaplains, uh, you know, it's really helpful when we have a chaplain who speaks Tagalog and uh, can yeah. speak sailors from the Philippines. Uh, but also, there's a lot of imagery from 25 South Street that uh, focuses on the diversity of, of sailors and, you know, the mural with all the flags where, where people are from. So that, that provides some really useful context for, for that, uh, and why that was turned into a kind of monument. Yeah, um, yeah, the census data for 25 South Street, we have five to 6,000 entries. So this is getting ahead of myself, but um, so there's sort of the street view census data where you can, you can pick up on all this ethnic diversity um, of, of people who are staying in the boarding houses. And then once we get to the Siemens Church headquarters, which could hold 580, I think, dormitory rooms, um, even the diversity within there, although it was somewhat segregated, to what extent we're still trying to figure that out. Um, yeah, it's pretty staggering, uh, the, the ethnic diversity of this workforce. And that, that holds true today, as you're, as you're saying. So I, I like this picture. I'm, I, I don't really have a guess as to the date, but it just kind of um, gives you a view from Brooklyn and you can see Oh, my mouse isn't showing up, but um, this is Siemens Church, Church's headquarters at 25 South Street, which was built uh, adjacent to County Slip, which um, has already come up once in the presentation, and it's in, uh, it's in Ward 1 or um, pretty close to the tip of the battery, and it is a pretty remarkable building. Um, Archibald Mansfield was the first superintendent of Siemens Church. This was sort of his vision for a sailor's hotel. And so you can trace the trajectory of this project from the boarding house at 52 Market Street, which Siemens Church uh, shut down in 1904 to this million dollar building that in 
was constructed in 1912, opened in 1913, um, which could hold, uh, like I said, 580 um, dorm rooms. And the idea is, you know, the, the way to get rid of these boarding houses um, is to essentially build a superstructure that could take care of every conceivable need that the sailor ashore might have. Yeah, because at one point they had buildings kind of scattered everywhere. They had the Breakwater Hotel over in, uh, uh, at the bottom of Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. They had, yeah. uh, you know, they had the churches, they had, uh, there was a place where they had sort of money services, you know, the questions about how you get pay and how you store your, your worldly goods that, uh, when you're on shore. Uh, right. And those were all kind of scattered all over the place. Yeah, they actually took over the British shipping office at one battery. Um, so they, they're moving from this decentralized model of ministry to a centralized model of ministry. And, you know, you can see this building towering over or at least competing with the surrounding superstructures of the time. Um, you know, again, it was, it was known as the million dollar home for, for sailors. Uh, you can see some of the donors in the uh, text here, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, Frick, Juilliard, Carnegie, uh, three different Vanderbilts. Um, and this really gets to what I see as sort of the dual, the dual mission of Siemens Church at this time. One was to provide this sort of surrogate domestic space for uh, a workforce that was inherently transient and many of whom didn't have permanent addresses or, um, or families or who were estranged from their families or who had intentionally left their families. Um, so that surrogate domestic space is one aspect of the mission. And the other aspect of the mission is, is a more traditional strict reform uh, to build this reformatory in order to create a stable, sober, both literally and figured, figuratively, and trained uh, merchant, um, you know, merchant mar mar mariner fleet of workers. It's really a, a 360 services kind of approach here. Yeah, it's like the Walmart, I call it the Walmart of, uh, you know, mariner services. Um, so you have the employment bureau. So like I said, these, these contracts that are happening in boarding houses and saloons are now, you know, there's a, there's a window you walk up, it's, it's more official, there's a shipping agent there. Um, so that the idea is to kind of uh, sanitize and, and, and uh, regulate that process. Uh, the post office for me is another fascinating aspect of the Institute because Again, these, a lot of these folks didn't have permanent addresses. And so they would get mail sent to 25 South Street once it was established and um, up and running. And just, just, they would get mail from all over the world because family members or friends knew that those sailors would be stopping in New York at some point. Um, no, I've heard 25 South Street described as the, uh, the, the most populous address in the world. Yeah, so the, the, the federal government took it over in 1927 because it got so large. The post um, office. The post office. Yeah. And then they, they ran it through 1968 when the building came down. Um, but yeah, if you had a sailor at sea, you didn't really know quite where they were and you wanted to reach them, you, you could send a letter to 25 South Street, you know, Joe Smith. Um, that might be a, a <laughs> there might be a few Joe Smiths in there, but uh, you know, it, it, it most likely would reach reach the the sailor at some point. So this this is sort of creating that surrogate domestic space. You know, giving these folks a semblance of uh, of a home. Well, you say surrogate domestic space and semblance of home, and we're about halfway through and haven't got to Janet Roper yet. So I hope she's coming. Yeah, up yeah. <laughs> okay, speed it up. This is a picture of the dorm room. Obviously, it's a there's a lot of staged photos in the um, in the in the archives, but this, this this gets at sort of the reformed, the reformatory aspect. You know, this is the young sailor connecting. He's got letters behind, uh, um, beside him on his bed. Um, there's you know nicely lit uh, lunch counter. Often saloons would give out free food if you were there to drink. 
So um, alternative there. 25 South Street had um, a pretty impressive array of medical services. So this is, uh, looks like just a straight up doctor uh, performing some sort of procedure. Um, eye exams, there was a, a dental clinic, um, which is really important because uh, sailors needed to pass eye exams and um, they would be denied employment based on, you know, if they had bad teeth or poor eyesight. Uh, so those are very important services. Then there were sort of like quality of life services, a barber shop, uh, you know, slop chest where you could get equipment. My well, that's more than quality of life with the, the clothing. I mean, it's, I mean slop yeah. chest, if, you, if your ship goes down, you've lost everything. What do you do? And which brings right. us to the Titanic story too. Right. And again, you, you could get all this stuff out, you know, a block away in Sailor Town. But what they were trying to do is provide sort of a one-stop service that was regulated by Siemens Church. And you knew you were getting a good deal. You weren't getting, you know, you, you, right. you trust. Yeah. Yeah. Library, game room, uh, Christmas at sea, we'll come back to, I think. So the Titanic, um, so, you know, as we, we all probably know, Titanic sinks early morning hours of April 15th, 1912. Coincidentally, that's the same exact um, date that the cornerstone of 25 South Street is, is laid. And they have a really um, uh, large ceremony to celebrate it. Uh, but news of the sinking starts to trickle into New York City on, on that morning. And you have board members um, at this time, in, including FDR and uh, J.P. Morgan and all of those donors that we mentioned. J.P. Morgan, of course, owned White Star Line and Titanic. Uh, so you, you get this real uh, early reaction to the, the tragedy and folks are up there giving speeches. They don't know any of the details of what happened. There's a lot of confusion. Um, there's some headlines saying that, you know, most of the people died. There's some headlines saying that, you know, very few people died. Uh, so a lot of confusion, but there's always the, there's already this sort of mythic heroic tale that comes out in these speeches at the the cornerstone laying ceremony. It's just a real tragic coincidence. Um, so Carpathia arrives with survivors, and this is the surviving crew members from Titanic. Um, they're hosted by the American Seamen's Friends Society, which is another maritime ministry organization based in New York. And their building is still there, right? It's a hotel or something now? It's on Jane Street. Yeah, it's a hotel. Um, it's a pretty hip, you know, bar hotel on Jane Street. Um, so Siemens Church and American Siemens Friends Society um, visit these folks. They, they were kind of held up in New York for three or four days until they were brought back to Southampton, where many of them were from. Um, White Star Line wasn't treating them very well. They weren't allowed to get in touch with their family members back home. Uh, their pay stopped when the ship went down mid, mid, uh, in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, there's some interesting quotes in newspapers who managed to get access to the crew members who were survived. They were lodging complaints against White Star Line. Uh, but Siemens Church donated clothing, as you can see in this photograph. Um, this, this man handing over a jacket and, and kits, you know, all that stuff that they, the, that they would have lost um, and needed to get to get back home if they're going on Lapland, the ship that took them back. Um, a year later, the Siemens Church raises money. Um, I believe Molly Brown was involved in this as well as the Women's Council of Siemens Church in, in fundraising to construct this lighthouse on the top 12th story of 25 South Street. And this was a functioning lighthouse um, until 1968. I had a time ball that was lowered every day at noon. And, uh, you know, plenty of accounts of um, folks in New York using that to sort of tell time and, and keep time during the day as they went about their business. And so this, this, um, this lighthouse went down with the building and was, uh, was rescued really by 
um, by the South Street Seaport Museum, which had been founded in the 1960s, pretty recent to, or not, not that far uh, preceding the, the uh, demolition of the building at 25 South Street. There, there's almost a handoff here of the New York, you know, the, the functions of Port City, not that Stephen Church left Lower Manhattan, but there, there is this sort of South Street Seaport coming in as the port work was drifting over to Newark. Right, yeah, so let's see, where are we at? Oh, there's Janet Roper. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll get back to that point, but this is, this is the house mother, Janet Roper. That was her official title. And um, again, the surrogate domestic space. So there's plenty of accounts. She was, you know, this beloved figure who um, would provide counseling services for, for, for sailors, you know, just kind of lending an ear to folks um, who needed to talk. Uh, and also she, she founded and operated the Missing Seamen's Bureau, which, um, I'm not sure when that ended, but it, it began during or after the uh, First World War, where in, in response to this demand for um, help locating sailors who had been displaced or killed uh, during the war. And these are merchant civilians, but of course they become targets of, um, you know, uh, of the other side because they're carrying pre precious war cargo and essentially fueling the war. Um, so she would get hundreds and th maybe thousands of requests for, for help. Her rule, rule of thumb was if the sailor didn't want to be found, which was happened, you know, people sometimes don't want to be found, um, she wouldn't disclose information about them. So that was, that's kind of an interesting caveat to, uh, to the Missing Seamen's Bureau. Um, you can skip over some of this. Obviously, the Great Depression sailors took a hit. There's fascinating labor union activity in New York along the waterfront. Um, and our the story here is, is just vast. And uh, for those of you who want to spend more time looking at any of these images, I think Doug will give you the link to this uh, the slideshow. It, it lives live on the internet, uh, so with all the captions, and just it doesn't have Jonathan talking and answering your questions live. So, so don't worry right. about. That. Yeah, so these so th these unions were kind of surrounding 25 South Street. It's really interesting to kind of map them out. Um, great photograph of the early origins of the, you know, the Maritime Education Unit of Siemens Church, which tried to re replic replicate the flying bridge on the roof um, of, of 25 South Street, as we, we can see here. So they taught navigation and all sorts of uh, seamanship um, open an official school. Uh, and again, mariners, merchant, merchant mariners during World War II died at a higher, or suffered a higher casualty rate than any branch of the armed services proportionally. So one in 26 was the casualty rate, despite the, there being civilians. Um, and they, they still haven't received full veteran status or any of the benefits of the GI Bill. That's another story. <laughs> so Siemens Church, as Stefan mentioned, poor traffic moves out to New Jersey. Increasingly, um, Siemens Church moves to 15th Street, State Street, which is literally at the tip of the battery, and uh, still operating uh, dormitory services and a lot of the same services at 25 South Street, but there is a steep de decline in demand from sailors because they're out in New Jersey. Um, so I've got a question here that's up your alley. Uh, Dennis wants to know, did the, C the uh, Siemens Church Institute School relate to the Merchant Marine Academy at all? So the Merchant Marine Academies were formed in, as part of the Merchant Marine Act of 36. Um, they, didn't, they didn't collaborate in any official function, um, but I would say that Siemens Church kind of operated as an auxiliary to, the, to not only the academies, but to the federal government in terms of training and housing qualified mariners who could, um, who could be ready to go, uh, you know, take up a job on a ship and, and, and go supply the allied front. Um, but no, I, I would say they didn't 
officially uh, work with the academies, although they worked kind of alongside them. So like Fort Schuyler and Kings Point and Sheepshead Bay and Hoffman Island, they're all kind of, you know, they're all kind of clustered um, working alongside Siemens Church. So, so this is a, a pretty cool view of um, New Jersey, I'm guessing in the 50s, really before or, or right at the beginning of when port traffic starts to move there. Um, and you can see there, the, the reason why the port traffic moved there is that the Port Authority and New Jersey really invested in it, accommodating the larger ships. They knew this was coming and Manhattan was not going to be able to accommodate these ships. So they basically filled in this kind of blank slate here at, at the edge of um, Newark and Elizabeth and Bayonne, and therefore they were able to welcome these larger ships that started to offload cargo like this, um, which is a great picture. Yeah, yeah. Um, our ship. And so Siemens Church very, you know, you know intelligently um, sort of speculated, speculated that this was happening, saw it was happening, and they constructed a site at Port Newark in 1961. There it is right there, um, opened in the 60s. This building is still there. It's now the International Seafarers Center. Um, and this is what Port Newark looks like today. Uh, There's so been some uh, chatter uh, on the chat here about uh, uh, Google's struggle with the word Siemens. I know uh, the, uh, they keep making it a, 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 uh, the, the, the company name, but uh, uh, so okay. I know Siemens Church Institute's uh, really embraced the word seafarers, and uh, yeah. I guess this is another advantage of that term, is that it doesn't confuse the AI. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, seafarer would be the, the blue water folks, and we're going to talk about the inland mariners briefly, because I know I'm running out of time. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we blue water seafarers, brown water river inland, and, and that would be brown, brown water mariners. So... The, the terminology has changed. You know, what's what's a sailor? What's a seaman? What's a seafarer? What's a mariner? It's it gets confusing. So this is a shot, uh, pretty modern, or you know, maybe from five five years ago of the International Seafarers uh, Center that Siemens Church operates in Port Newark, and you can see again, it's right in the heart of uh, the port. Um, obviously very different looking than the early photos we saw of the floating church and the poor traffic that was happening there, um, but still receiving many, many um, visitors. So in 2019, this is according to, the, to our annual report, um, 25,000 port, worker, port workers, that includes longshoremen and truckers in addition to seafarers who come off of their ships. 25,000 visitors at the center. Um, and uh, 14,000 seafarers were transported. So the big, the big task is getting them from their ships to either the center or usually it's the Jersey Gardens Mall. <laughs> so, you know, if they have time to get to Manhattan, then, you know, that's great. But a lot of them don't make it to Manhattan, even if they want to go because of that quick turnaround time. Yeah. that Stefan was uh, alluding to earlier. So um, Siemens Church provide van service, free pickup to Jersey Gardens and or wherever they want to go within reason um, so that crews can get off their ships and enjoy shore leave. So that's Port Newark. Uh, Paducah, Kentucky and Houston, um, Siemens Church operates uh, maritime education centers and they've done so since I think 1997 and 2001 I think are the dates um, so they they train mariners inland mariners um, on U.S. inland rivers great the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico and they provide chaplain services so just like in Port Newark I, I forgot to mention chaplains actually go on the ships for seafarers who can't get off or, or just are not getting off and um, provide pastoral care or sell them something like a phone card or a SIM card. Um, they also do money wire transfers, things like that. So uh, it's the, out in Paducah and Houston's combination of training and chaplaincy, pastoral care. 
And so out in... Um, but, they're, but they're also doing normal chaplain things. You know, we always have photos from Ash Wednesday of... Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I don't have the terminology. Uh, you were raised Catholic, weren't you? Uh, what's the ashes on the forehead thing? But uh, um, Ash Wednesday. <laughs> thank you, yeah. <laughs> that's as, that's good, as good as I can get. But uh, yeah, no, absolutely. They do, they do chaplaincy. I mean, on the rivers, there's, if there's a death, um, which happens, uh, or in the port um, in New Jersey, uh, the chaplains are often called to do, um, to provide counseling to shipmates or other crew members who are experiencing trauma or mourning or grief. Um, they, they hold services, they, they're there for spiritual counseling as needed. Um, so that's a, that's a very important point. That, that aspect of the Institute has not been lost, although uh, it's a far cry from you know, the, the temperance pledges and the proselytizing that was going on in the 19th century or even the early 20th century. Um, so training of 2000, nearly 2,000 mariners from I think 60-ish companies between Paducah and Houston they switched to online learning so that they can keep this up during the pandemic or even before that they were building up online learning programs so that they can reach um, even more Mariners and actually 9,000 Mariners apparently received online training just in 2019. And do you know why Paducah? Paducah is at the confluence of multiple riverways. Um, and I, I'm not going to name, I, ca I can't name all of them, but uh, I'm Ohio sure. is one of them, right? And then there are a couple that Ohio, come down from Kentucky, yeah. and there's a big waterfall naturally there. Uh, that's like my, the extent of my knowledge, I'm afraid. Yeah, I know there's, a, there's at least three um, rivers that converge. In Paducah, there's a bunch of towing companies and uh, a, a, a pretty large workforce, people who work on the rivers um, that live nearby basically um or at least you know report to work there so that's why paducah houston obviously is a proximity to the gulf of mexico so yeah that's a big port yeah yeah and i got a, i think two more slides so this is the type of training they do they do simulator training it's really impressive i've been to paducah and seen you know you you, you get like seasick in these things i mean or the wow I guess. <laughs> I love the through line to this from that image you showed us of the guy on the roof of South Street Seaport with the, uh, yeah. uh, the, the bridge sort of uh, rig. Yeah, and this has gone undergone major renovations. It's state-of-the-art tech. Even since I've been there last, they've like completely renovated and updated their technology. So wow. this, is, this is what we're talking about when we mentioned training. Um, this is a bit of an old photo because Doug and Marge no longer work here, but they were, this is, uh, this is Doug Stevenson who, who ran the Center for Seafarers Rights for many, many years. And Siemens Church has a very long history of legal advocacy for, for sailors and seafarers. Um, and these days, uh, so in 2019, the Center for Seafarers Rights handled 39 cases and mostly they involve disputes over contracts, wages, medical care, um, access to shore leave, which is a big, big problem, really. Um, the, the reasons that non-citizen seafarers, which make, who, who make up really the, the bulk of the blue water workforce these days are denied shore leave so that they can't get off the ship in a US port. Um, are pretty staggering. And so uh, that's one of the issues that the Center for Seafarers' Rights works on. Um, abandoned. And, uh, I will update in the chat. Uh, Mark is watching out there and yeah, our yeah. boss. And uh, he, he uh, says that uh, it's the confluence of the Ohio and the Tennessee and about a half an hour from the Mississippi is Paducah. Uh, we also okay. had a question about Christmas at sea, so I'll let you wrap up what you wanted to get to, but we do want to mention Christmas at sea before we uh, finish up here. Yeah, so Christmas at sea, uh, still, it's still going. It started in 1898 during the Spanish-American War, and a really unique program. It's, it's a network of knitters from at least ar around the, the country, maybe even internationally, who donate knit items to, to seafarers and, and 
Mariners. So um, started, started in 1898 and has remained incredibly successful. So last year they um, distributed 17,000 knitted items uh, from 1,000 individual donors uh, just in one year alone, usually around, you know, obviously around Christmas time um, when things start to get pretty frigid on, on, on board. Uh, so, so that's, uh, that's kind of an overview of the current work that we're doing um, at Siemens Church. Um, just a few other things I'll mention. The shore leave issue, they've done, they do shore leave studies every year to kind of uh, survey reasons for denial of shore leave. Um, uh, they, Siemens Church has launched a, a really innovative study on, on piracy and the effects of piracy on mental health of seafarers. Um, they, they've done physical, biological health studies on, on inland mariners. I was going to say, that isn't, I mean, obviously, especially now with people being stuck on ships for longer periods of time, mental health is a huge issue, but yes. it's been a big issue on the inland waterways, too. Yeah, there's been suicides and, and pro real, real problems with um, mental health, and so that's where the chaplaincy comes in. Um, so we have, yeah, there's at least two chaplains who, who kind of roam around the rivers, river systems and you know, do their best to keep up with the needs of uh, that, that workforce, who again, remain largely invisible um, to people on land. I mean, maybe a bit less so since they're, you know, people like to live next near, near rivers, but uh, yeah, there's a huge need. And yes, the isolation on blue water ships is, is uh, yeah, that causes all sorts of problems. And, you know, being away from home for so long, being away from your families for months and months and months um, with limited access to communication technologies, uh, that's, that really weighs on, on the international sea, seafarers, for sure. So- uh, got a on. question, uh, as we, we, well, I know we only have a couple of minutes left here, but a uh, uh, question about uh, how are uh, people working on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway uh, how is, is SCI working with them addressing their needs at all? I don't, I don't know as much about that. I know that we have a presence there and maybe Mark can chime in in the chat, but I know that um, we have a Reverend Kempton Baldridge who uh, is active on the Great Lakes in addition to, he's based out of Paducah, but um, he, he gets around. Uh, so, and I know that, that I believe um, Paducah, also, the online training and combined with Paducah probably provides quite a bit of uh, services to Great Lake Mariners also. I don't know if Mark's chiming in or not. I can't see the, ch the chat. I, I haven't seen him, but uh, but yeah, I, I expect he'll, uh, we got, he, he just chimed in. So okay. yeah, a few river chaplains associate, uh, chap river chaplain associates near the Great Lakes. Okay, uh, great. great. Um, Great. Uh, so yeah, if there are any last questions, this is the moment to get it in here. Uh, and uh, while we're getting that in, uh, so Jonathan, how, what's, what's your summary on this? When we're looking at the, the Siemens Church Institute and its history, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, what's, what is the story that we're seeing here? It sounds like we could do many sessions uh, about uh, the Siemens Church Institute and all the various services that's done, but and if you stop sharing your screen, it'll just be us talking. But uh, uh, there we go. But yeah, so how how would you sort of put Siemens Church Institute in a nutshell uh, from a historical perspective? Wow. Um, you know, I think in studying from a historical, okay, so from an historian's perspective, what I've gotten out of processing the Siemens Church Institute archives, which by the way, they're hosted at Queens College. Uh, the finding aid is up online for the collection. So the inventory of what's in there, it's at least 300 linear feet of processed records. All of those photographs that we use are from that collection. Um, 
I think what I've learned uh, is that through studying Siemens Church, I'm studying the Port of New York, and uh, pretty much every chapter in my dissertation that I'm now turning into a book, which covers um, basically the idea of citizenship in US ports for sailors. Every single chapter in that dissertation, I found Siemens Church is like this recurring character. Um, so, you know, the early years of philanthropy, it's sort of this urban uh, confrontation between um, almost like this underclass of transient workers and the um, sort of this Episcopalian elite uh, or upper middle class Victorian with Victorian sensibilities and the public at large. Um, you know, at, at the heart of key legal issues, there's a chapter on the 13th Amendment that- oh, really? That, so very- that the amendment to that uh, freed African-Americans that ended slavery. Yeah, and, and the part that I write about is that it also ended uh, involuntary servitude. Yeah. So in 1898, I know, I know I'm short on time. 1898, um, there's a case where three sailors desert their vessel in Oregon and they're imprisoned uh, because that was the law. You, you could not desert your vessel. In, in essence, you couldn't break contract or you would be, you'd be thrown in jail, arrested, and they were. Um, and the union came to their aid. There was a very strong union on the West Coast. At the time, I think it was the Sailors Union of the Pacific. And um, went all the way to the Supreme Court because these sailors were arguing, hey, this is a violation of the 13th Amendment. This is involuntary servitude. You're putting us in chains and dragging us back to our workplace. We don't want to go. You don't have to pay us. We're just breaking our contract. And the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. You don't, the 13th Amendment doesn't apply to, to you because you're a special class of workers. Um, and so that was really the origins of the Center for Seafarers' Rights, because Siemens Church, among with, uh, uh, along with many other organizations in, in the union, um, were launched a campaign, which resulted in legislation in the progressive era that guaranteed sailors' right to shore leave. That is still an issue, as I mentioned, with non right. seafarers. Who don't have the proper documentation, they can't get off their ship. So that, that really brings us to this present moment. That's uh, in a great yeah. way. Uh, we do have to wrap things up. Before we do, I just want to well, thank you very much for taking the time out to, to join us today. And uh, uh, you, know, I, you and I have a lot of work to do with these archives and spreading the message about Siemens Church and, and making sure your, your book projects happen. Uh, I also want to mention, uh, germane to the interests of folks watching this, next Tuesday, uh, Andrew Gustafson will be doing a program at 12.30 uh, called An Unfree Fleet, Slavery in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So uh, definitely worth checking that out. And uh, he'll discuss the connections between the history of slavery and the Brooklyn Navy Yard, as well as historical connections to the Navy. So uh, kind of uh, very germane to the things we've been talking about here in these last moments uh, about uh, labor issues and the waterfront. Uh, and uh, so again, yeah, thank you, Jonathan. I'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, you can connect with us online to uh, ask further questions and we'll get you connected to Jonathan. Check out the websites that we posted, including that for this particular slideshow you just saw. Uh, and, uh, and, and check out the Siemens Church Institute website and the archives. We're always up to something, and, uh, uh, and there's a lot of excitement there with events happening this summer. So thank you. Uh, we'll see you again on Thursday for our next program, uh, looking at the closure of the Navy Yard in 1966. Take care. Be safe till then. Thanks, everybody.